Welcome to another lecture on neuroradiology. I'm Michael Hoke, and today I'll be talking about how to stay out of trouble when reading a potential multiple sclerosis MRI. Um, this lecture will be in two parts, white spots and red flags, and uh, let's get started. So the problem is the reliance or over-reliance on MRI to make a clinical diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So what do we do with uh, an MRI study when we see white spots? And you know, it's common, for example, 51% of headache patient MRIs can have flare bright white spots. So what do we do with these things? How do we stay out of trouble? How do we better diagnose MS or better diagnose uh, MS mimics? So um, you have to remember that the MRI criteria for multiple sclerosis were not created to differentiate multiple sclerosis from other white matter abnormalities, but to identify patients at risk for converting to multiple sclerosis after their initial presentation. And one of the quotes I like is, uh, over-reliance on MRI interpretation in the setting of clinical findings suggestive but not diagnostic for multiple sclerosis may be a major cause of misdiagnosis. So the objectives for this first talk, um, well, overall, we're going to try and decrease your misdiagnosis of multiple sclerosis on MRI. But for this first part, we're going to do a brief summary of the clinical syndromes of the clinical syndrome of multiple sclerosis. And then we're going to emphasize the definitions or locations of these white spots, bright spots on MRI. So what is multiple sclerosis? It's an inflammatory and neurodegenerative disease of the CNS, usually affecting young adult women, typically 20 to 50 years old. It's a disease of inflammation, demyelination, remyelination, and axonal loss. And on this histology slide, you can see the perivascular lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates and macrophages affecting the white matter, um, usually surrounding the vessel here. And we have to remember that MS is a clinical syndrome, not a radiographic syndrome not an MRI syndrome, clinical syndrome. And when you look in the chart, you want to look for these things, the presenting symptoms of depression, fatigue, vertigo, numbness, tingling, pain, bladder dysfunction, visual impairment, and the uh, classic Lermite sign. Some people, there's enough, some people don't know there's another phenomenon called Uthoff's phenomenon where um, multiple sclerosis symptoms worsen in the heat and people used to uh, put their patients in hot tubs, hot water baths to bring about uh, symptom exacerbations. Uh, when you're in the chart, you want to look for clinical signs of action tremor, decreased perception of pain, vibration, limb position, spasticity, and poor coordination or balance. Uh, for the MRI, um, there's been revised newer uh, McDonald criteria from 2017. And when you're reading the MRI, you want to look for uh, dissemination in space and time. And in space, you want lesions in two or more characteristic locations cortical location, which is new for the 2017 revised criteria, uh, juxtacortical white matter, periventricular white matter, infratentorial white matter, which would be uh, brain stem or cerebellum, um, or uh, spinal cord. And the more of these lesions you have, the more confident you can be in uh, suggesting MS on the MRI. And then dissemination in time would be uh, a new T2 white spot or an enhancing lesion on a follow-up MRI or the simultaneous presence of enhancing and non-enhancing lesions. Um, CSF oligoclonal bands were also a new addition to the revised criteria. And then also the third component is that you, uh, this requires the absence of a better explanation for symptoms and signs. So three components, space, time, and the absence of a better explanation. So let's get into it. The MS uh, lesion definitions, they're not just semantics. So white spot locations you want to look for, cortical, juxtacortical, periventricular, infratentorial, spinal cord, and then a couple of others that I have found over, the, over time have helped me, uh, colossal septal and anterior temporal lobe white matter. Uh, white matter spot locations that are not that specific for MS would be subcortical white matter, deep white matter, and uh, like this patchy central pons appearance that you see with chronic small vessel ischemic changes. Let's go through these. So for cortical lesions, um, you can see a lesion affecting the cortex here with the yellow arrow. Um, these are best appreciated on the double inversion recovery images. This is a 3D flare, but um, you could window the 3D flare similar to a double inversion recovery. And then remember, the cortical lesion location is new for the 2017 criteria. 
Uh, juxtacortical lesions, again, also specific for multiple sclerosis. So this has to be a lesion touching the cortex. There cannot be any normal appearing subcortical white matter between the lesion and the cortex. This is just a juxtacortical. Uh, this would be an example of not a juxtacortical lesion. These are subcortical lesions. Uh, don't use this term unless you can directly see the lesion contacting the cortex. This would be subcortical, not juxtacortical. These would not be specific for multiple sclerosis. And here's another example. This would be subcortical lesions. I think it's the thumb down, not specific. Uh, periventricular lesions, the lesion must be touching the ventricular surface, like this lesion on the left. Not periventricular, not touching the ventricle. Also, uh, deep white matter, not touching the ventricle, not in the subcortical white matter, not cortical. These, again, also are not specific for multiple sclerosis. Uh, moving along to infratentorial lesions, brainstem and cerebellum. These usually affect the white matter in the cerebellum. You can see some in the white matter tracts of the brainstem. Common locations for MS brainstem lesions, you know, usually when they're focal, they affect known white matter tracts in the brainstem, like in this first picture of the medial lemniscus, and then the middle picture of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and then the last picture of the superior cerebellar peduncles common location or any of the superior, middle, or inferior cerebellar peduncles. And then here's a paper from a while ago, 1987, but it still holds true where you have, where they did like an overlay of common MS lesion locations in the brainstem. And this is where you kind of see them in the ascending and descending white matter tracts. Uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is like this patchy central pons lesion that you see with chronic microvascular ischemic changes. Not good for MS. You want to really see lesions confined to known white matter tracts. Other lesions that have helped me, not in the McDonald criteria, but are more specific for MS are this first one here, a colossal septal lesion, where there's a lesion touching the colossal septal interface, as opposed to microvascular white matter changes that do not touch. And then also anterior temporal lobe white matter lesions. You know, when you have really severe microvascular ischemic changes, they tend to not affect the anterior temporal lobe white matter. But with multiple sclerosis, you tend to see periventricular temporal lobe white matter lesions. So keep an eye out for those to help differentiate. And then moving on to spinal cord. Usually spinal cord lesions are short segment, peripheral, asymmetric, and multiple in the cord. And what I find is helpful is you really have to aggressively window the uh, axial T2 images to see the lesions. And then the lesions really stick out like a sore thumb and you won't miss them. And I think, the, I think a good rule of thumb would be when you're windowing aggressively or narrowly, narrowly window, the, window so that the skeletal muscle in the, in the neck is the same intensity as the air around the patient. They both are the, sim, the similar hypo intensity. And then you'll really see the uh, short segment peripheral asymmetric and multiple lesions for MS of the spinal cord. And the way to remember that, of course, is SPAM. All right, so a quick word or two on enhancement. That was the white matter lesion locations that help us make a confident suggestion of demyelinating disease or MS in an MRI. Remember, it's a clinical diagnosis. Uh, enhancement, so an enhancing or diffusion restricting lesions are indicative of active disease, and this one slice here would satisfy McDonald criteria for dissemination in time because you have one lesion that's enhancing and another lesion that is not enhancing on the right. And remember, when you see enhancement, you want to look for that incomplete ring. This case was initially thought to maybe be toxoplasmosis for whatever reason. Maybe they thought the patient being 50 years old was too old for multiple sclerosis, and maybe they focused on this patchy nodular lesion. But as you can see, there are three additional lesions that have incomplete peripheral ring enhancement, which is the classic enhancement pattern for multiple sclerosis or demyelination for that matter. So just peripheral, a, like a differential for peripheral enhancement types, if you had complete enhancement, that would be not uh, a demyelinating lesion, like in this case here of immunocompromised CNS lymphoma. Another complete peripheral enhancement type would be a glioblastoma where you have like a smooth outer margin, but the thick inner irregular rind of enhancement. Another peripheral enhancement type would be for an abscess where you have the thinner wall facing the ventricle side of the enhancing lesion. And then of course, here's our incomplete ring for a tumefactive demyelinating lesion, which is classic. Another type of enhancement that you might see if you're really looking for it is leptomeningeal enhancement in known multiple sclerosis cases. This is good to know so you don't get worked up when you see new leptomeningeal enhancement in a known MS case because this can just be 
a sign of cortical inflammation. And in this case here, we have leptomeningeal signal on the post on the flare and on the T1 post. And then that patient developed uh, cortical, more cortical lesions in that area and subcortical lesions in that area on the follow-up study two years later. So if you're really looking for it, about 20% of multiple sclerosis cases show small foci of leptomeningeal enhancement. It can just be a sign of active cortical inflammation. Don't get worked up or bent out of shape about it. But again, these are cases of known MS. If you saw somebody that wasn't a clinically diagnosed MS case, then maybe if you see leptomeningeal enhancement, you should probably think of other things. And we'll get to those in the second talk. Just something to keep in mind. All right, so take home points for this first talk. MS is a clinical diagnosis, not an MRI diagnosis. Those McDonald criteria were created to identify patients at risk for converting to MS after an initial clinical presentation, not for differentiating MS from other diseases. White spot location matters. For example, a juxtacortical lesion much touch the cortex, a periventricular lesion much touch the ventricle. You want to really look for those cortical lesions, juxtacortical lesions, periventricular, infratentorial, and spinal cord lesions. And when you're looking for the spinal cord lesions, remember to aggressively window on those axial T2 weighted images. And leptomeningeal enhancement is possible in known MS cases. Remember that tidbit. So uh, that's it for the first talk. I want to thank Tim Shepard for some of the slides and the other contributors to this talk. Uh, look forward to part two.